Sometimes very old ideas can make a comeback, even in astronomy, such as that of the planet Vulcan, hypothetically orbiting inside the orbit of Mercury close to the Sun. At the beginning of the 17th century, observations of something, an apparent body or bodies within the orbit of Mercury started to appear in reports. In fact, it happened not long after the observations of Galileo had begun to completely redefine the solar system, much to the later chagrin of his major detractor, the Pope. Oddly, the early reports of objects passing in front of the Sun sometimes really were that, in a sense. Such as one in 1611 by Christoph Scheiner that ended up actually being the inadvertent discovery of sunspots. There really were dark spots there, but they were not planets. But the idea of another planet inside the orbit of Mercury could not be stopped and persisted for centuries, and in 1859, no less than Urbain Le Verrier, the astronomer that correctly predicted the existence of the planet Neptune through the detection of disturbances in the orbit of Uranus, jumped on the bandwagon. There actually were others involved, but Le Verrier mathematically detected similar weirdness with the orbit of Mercury as he had with Uranus and Neptune leading him to suspect that a tiny planet was there, tugging at Mercury. That was, after all, the simplest answer, except the real answer was far from simple indeed. Given that the same methods Le Verrier had used to correctly predict the existence of Neptune were also what was used for Mercury and thus Vulcan, it seemed that the case was strong for a planet inside the orbit of Mercury. This too did not happen in a vacuum, however. An amateur astronomer and lawyer named Capel Loft observed a solid body as he saw it pass across the disk of the Sun in 1818, and yet another report from Bavaria was by Franz von Paula Gruthausen, who saw two small spots pass by the face of the Sun. This was bolstered by another German astronomer, J.W. Pastroff, who also saw two small spots in multiple observations in the 1820s and 30s. In the 1840s, exhaustive searches were done to try to catch Vulcan transiting the Sun, including those of German astronomer Heinrich Schwab, who looked every clear day for years to no avail. Vulcan did not seem to be there for him, but for some, it did. However, by 1859, Le Verrier was confident in his calculations of the irregularities in the orbit of Mercury, and believed that they had to stem from a nearby planet influencing its orbit or alternatively, a large series of asteroids. New reports of observations of some unknown object transiting the Sun led Le Verrier to announce a new planet, but no one was able to reliably confirm it. It continued on. Some observers saw something, some did not, including one case where two astronomers were observing the Sun at the same time from two different locations, and one saw Vulcan, and the other did not. Incidentally, Le Verrier was not wrong about the peculiarities of the orbit of Mercury, it's just the reason why. They really are there to this day, but he had no way of knowing anything about what actually causes them. He just knew the physics of Newton. But he had actually hit on something much deeper in astrophysics and didn't know it. It was not the simplest answer. You see, he was relying on the tried and true physics of Newton, that clocks tick the same everywhere in the universe and gravity was just gravity and time and space were not particularly linked. Yet he was seeing a discrepancy, all while assuming Newton was complete. This was one of a number of unconnected dots at the time that were hinting that Newton's ideas really were missing something. The answer required another half century, and one Albert Einstein, to show that things were not that clean cut with the universe. The reason given today in explaining the orbital irregularities Le Verrier discovered is actually an effect of general relativity, whereby the effects are accounted for by the curvature of space-time, brought about by the mass of the Sun, and Mercury being very close to it. Le Verrier had very little to go on there. The universe was seen very differently in his days than that of post-Einstein. And some have said, while that special relativity would almost certainly have been formulated by now had Einstein never existed, there were a number of people circling the drain on that one. It's possible, however, that without Einstein, we would still not have general relativity to this day, and perhaps people might still be looking for Vulcan. In that sense, they are, more on that in a bit, and we deal with physics of the future, 
that Luck and Einstein allowed us to hit on early. And seemingly that should have ended the debate over whether the planet Vulcan actually existed. Yet observations of Vulcan continued almost all the way up to Einstein, though there were none between the years 1866 and 78. In 1878, however, there was a total solar eclipse, and two respected astronomers spotted Vulcan again from two different locations. The astronomers were heavyweights. One was James Craig Watson, the director of the Ann Arbor Observatory, and a discoverer of a number of asteroids. And the other was Lewis Swift, known for having discovered and lent his name to several comets, including Comet Swift-Tuttle, that comes through every 133 years. And its debris spawns the yearly, famous Perseid meteor shower. More, the two observations generally matched initially, even though they were independently done, even down to the color, in that both reported Vulcan being red, with Watson claiming that it had a definite disk like a planet should have, and was actually showing a phase like the inner planets do. More precise calculations, however, showed that the observations actually did not match well in the location of the object. To this day, no one knows what those astronomers saw, only that all subsequent eclipses have failed to show anything unusual, and there have been many. If Vulcan had been there, we would have seen it by now. Many thousands now photograph and watch total eclipses worldwide. But there is a related mystery here that has not been ruled out. Recall that Le Verrier also floated the idea that the perturbations of Mercury could also have been caused by asteroids if they had enough mass. While they no longer are needed to explain Mercury's orbital quirks, the idea that there could be a belt of asteroids inside the orbit of Mercury still remains viable. Known hypothetically as Vulcanoids, they would inhabit a stable orbital zone near the Sun but would be very difficult to detect because of the glare of the sun. So far, no searches for Vulcanoids have yielded anything, including data from the Parker Solar Probe. But should any ever be found, they likely would be of a very primitive type, left over from the initial period of planet formation in the solar system, unlike any other known asteroids. And it has to be said, Every area of stability in the solar system of this nature has ended up hosting asteroids. So it would be rather odd that the stability zone inside the orbit of Mercury seemingly has nothing. It's also possible that while the Vulcanoids may have once existed, very early in the history of the solar system, they may have been scattered during the period of planetary migration that followed. Maybe someday we'll find a Vulcanoid asteroid candidate in some far reaches of the solar system far from its original home. But there's a weird aspect in thinking about the old idea of the planet Vulcan that still remains useful, though in a way more as a thought experiment. The reason is that planets inside the orbit of Mercury, while once viable, no longer are, and asteroids inside the orbit of Mercury is an ongoing question, though not of the collective mass needed to knock general relativity around in regards to Mercury. There is a much newer idea that can place something once again inside the orbit of Mercury, and it's the idea of tiny primordial black holes, something once again Le Verrier and his 19th century colleagues could not have conceived of. In a paper by S.B. Pagosian, link in the description below, the author explores the idea of Vulcan as a primordial black hole in the context of classical Newtonian physics. One of the reasons for doing this is that in recent years, physicists have been looking at the idea of primordial black holes that may or may not have formed in the early universe not long after the Big Bang, and like any object, can end up under the right circumstances captured in star systems, at places like the stability zone inside the orbit of Mercury. And there are ways that have been advanced to try to detect such black holes through microlensing events and other means. While it seems unlikely one would be inside the orbit of Mercury undetected, and with Mercury's orbital strangeness accounted for satisfactorily by general relativity, there is another idea out there that would be much harder to prove, but in a way, can't really be discounted because it is, so far as we know, physically possible. And that is the idea of the Sun having somehow absorbed a small primordial black hole. Again, this is an old idea, at least now. In 1971, Stephen Hawking suggested that a primordial black hole could have ended up in the center of the Sun. There was a reason to think this back in those days. There was an issue known as the solar neutrino problem, 
And one idea to solve this was that if you had a primordial black hole at the center of the sun, matter falling into it might explain the deficit of a certain type of neutrino from the sun. That problem has since been solved through other means, on how the sun emits neutrinos, but it actually did not discount the idea of a black hole of a certain mass being there. Now this is not a black hole in the sense of a giant star eating supermassive black hole. This would be small and primordial, created uniquely to the conditions of the environment of the universe after the Big Bang, and would need certain conditions to slowly eat its star. But it's interesting in that if enough of these tiny black holes, masses of asteroids, exist, then they would comfortably explain dark matter. That LOVA mass would not suck the star around it in, link to a paper by Loeb on that in the description, but would affect the star, and maybe something that could be tested. It's very unlikely, but not impossible, but it could be tested. If that were ever found to be the case, perhaps we should name it Vulcan. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently deeply concerned about the Vulcans. Star Trek fans will know, depending on the timeline you like, their planet Vulcan did not meet a particularly nice end. But had Gene Roddenberry listened to Urbain Le Verrier, Vulcan was already taken as a planet. And that thing would have been so far inside the sun's proximity and out of the habitable zone that it would have never been on the table for life, no matter how good you are at the Vulcan neck pinch. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.